And good morning. Thank you very much for joining this week's on Riders on Riders over at Triple Expresso. This is your host, Patrick Greenwood. Thank you for joining us on a wonderful Saturday morning. We're absolutely blessed to have an incredible author on this morning. I'm a huge uh, fan of her work, uh, Pashu Madawi. Thank you. Parasu, nice to see you this morning. Thank you for joining the show. Good morning, Patrick. Good morning from um, East Coast. It's afternoon for us and it's morning in West Coast. Good morning to you, Patrick, and thank you so much for having me. Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I was when I got a hold of your book and I had a chance to read it, uh, I, I really was speechless as going through from the very first page all the way to the end as well. Um, I first have to obviously quest for identity from Afghanistan to the world, uh, an incredible book, picked it up on Amazon. Um, my first question I ask, obviously, by looking at it is the cover says the world, in my view, when it comes to writing. I see this look on your face and you have kind of this little, I'm looking to the side, I'm in deep thought. What were you thinking when the cover was being made? What was sort of that look that you had and what was kind of running through your head at the time? With this picture, it's, um, uh, I read the book. Mm -hmm. and, and how did it kind of give you, what, what kind of gave you that, in, that expression going, Hmm. Were you thinking about the journey of the book? Were you thinking about how it got started? Were you thinking how it was ending? Or were you thinking kind of where you were going to go from there? It, it, how it started, because we oh. read the book and then um, the journey started at a coffee shop. And at the <laughs> coffee shop, I was uh, gazing at the window. Yes. Yeah. And uh, when uh, Cynthia, the photographer, when she came to my home and she took the pictures she said why don't we shoot one that you're gazing at the window when she said that it just clicked in my mind that wow that would be the start of the cover of the book and i explained that to her and how it started yes it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect because by looking at the cover, I'm thinking this woman is in deep thought. Then obviously when I saw the title meant of the identity, I thought that was really kind of very intriguing as well. One of the things I really appreciated about your writing, and I, I promise not to spoil your books. I, I want people to read it and enjoy it just as much as I did. But I think you did an incredible job telling your story by moving between the present and the past. Um, what was sort of the thought process when you were writing the book? You, know, you did an incredible job on talking about where you were, where you are now, but then where you came from. And then you brought yourself back again to the present. Then you moved back to you know the past a little bit. What were your thoughts on when you were writing? Why did you kind of write it in that way? Um, because uh, when I start writing this book, mm -hmm. I was just going like, uh, flashback and flash forward, flash. I kind of like this uh, non-linear way of writing, just going back, back and forth, back and forth. This is how it started. I said, instead of like um, going like chronology, like from uh, yeah, teenager to adult or from country to country, it's better to just have flashbacks from my past and then connect it to the present. I just wanted to do it was my own way. It was a beautiful blend. And, and the reason I, I, I want to compliment you on that is that many people that attempt to do that in writing, where they kind of go forward, backwards, backwards, forward, forward, to forward, and then people get lost in the story. I did not get lost one bit while writing, by reading your book. I really was following, especially, you know, obviously you brought in a very important emotional points of going back in time during your childhood, growing up in Afghanistan during the war torn years. And, and really kind of explaining in, in, in not graphical detail, but in very oriented detail, how painful it is to grow up in that side of the world, particularly for women. And, you know, and we take that for granted. We think we hear all the time about atrocities that happen everywhere in the world. But the way that you documented it by saying, no, it is very challenging, very painful. But I, I have to tell you, I, I grew to admire your father. Because your father never gave up on democracy in, in life, even though that the rest of the world kind of went past that and went on to something else. Yeah, I know. I, I really thought that was incredible. Now, when you finally moved on to Germany, which again, I'm not going to want to divulge too much of the book, and you kind of describe some of the friends that you met and some of the kind of mentors that you kind of, you know, were on to or working with as well. Did you expect that when you moved to Germany? Did you expect the people to be you know, open and helpful? Or were you expecting them to be much more harsher and more racial in their thinking? 
Uh, to be honest, I was thinking either way. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I was engaged. And when I went there, I was dealing with my own issues. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even thinking, but I, I wasn't expecting anything. Um, I was lost and I was confused. Uh, but when the people came across my way and helped me, mm -hmm. it took me aback. And later on in life, like in Canada, when mm -hmm. my son asked me that famous question when I went back to my roots and I thought, mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, that was amazing. Yes. Those people, they weren't my countrymen. They weren't mm -hmm. my related by blood, by family, mm -hmm. nothing. But they just like stood by my side and helped me to shape my life and mm -hmm. later on shape myself. Absolutely. And I, I have to tell you that the way you documented that was 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 wonderful. What was very intrigued to me, though, and I, I have to ask this question, when you backed away from your very first engagement and you wrote about that in the book and I thought, wow, this is one brave lady. <laughs> this is somebody that is not afraid to stand on her own. Did that have a lot to do with the title of identity? of establishing your identity as an independent, strong woman to say, I'm not going to follow tradition, even though you did a lot portion of the book. But when you actually walked away from your first, you know, arranged engagement, you know, how did you feel after that was over? Um, honestly, I, I even, I love that sentence on my book that I touch my collarbone and I say like, Ooh, I'm free. I can do whatever. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. Life had different, like, um, unfolded different uh, issues and yes. circumstances for me. And I thought, like, it would be, my journey would be easier after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And I would do whatever I wanted to do. But it wasn't the case. It well, wasn't the case. It wasn't but, something that I uh, planned to do, unfortunately. But made me... Uh, no regrets made me stronger. No yes. regrets made me stronger. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, what you plan and what there is a saying that mm -hmm. what you uh, men makes plans and upstairs guys loves. <laughs> That's two different things. Well, you never lost your sense of humility, and I and I and I kind of saw that in your book that when you took the job, I think as a dishwasher at one point, and I thought, well, this woman has been everywhere. She's done everything. She's got you know a lot of good backgrounds and strengths. She's got abilities, but you you even took that job as a dishwasher, even though that it was probably not what you should be doing, but you accepted it. You did it. And, and you went on with it and you made the most of it. And it seemed like your whole book was about no matter how much tragedy or how much pain there was, you always found this kind of better, better light of day. You found the better day out of all of it. And I thought that was very important to really bring across to the, as a reader that you were one that was not going to give up. You were not going to give in, that you're going to keep moving forward. I think no matter what tragedy you, you hit in the book, no matter if it was in Germany or later on in Canada, it, it didn't matter. You, you still found a way to kind of make things work. Make things work. Yes, yes. That's, yeah, that's very important. That's very important. When I was in Germany and as a young uh, girl, as a young woman, I had so much energy and I had so many dreams to fulfill. But the, um, it was just, I was struggling and I was trying hard just to mm -hmm. be somebody, become mm -hmm. someone. And uh, I was grabbing any opportunity, like, you know, um, came my way, um, mm -hmm. grabbed it, and I had a little bit of humor in it. And like, that's human beings. You have to move on. Yes. That, that's life. You have to move on. You have to keep going. And you did. And I think it was really special, particularly when you did meet your future husband and you did move to Canada and built a life for yourself. And, and I was, when I was sort of getting to that part of the book, I thought, OK, wow, well, it's going to get easy. Now she's in Canada. Now she's in North America. It's like, oh, no, <laughs> even in Canada, it's not that easy as well. Do you still are you still very much involved? in the Afghan community, even in Canada today? Do you still have a lot of Afghan friends? Do you see a lot of people, a lot of younger people coming from Afghanistan that remind you of yourself? Are you finding younger girls that are coming into North America 
that are trying to get an education. They're, they're becoming dishwashers. They're working in retail. And do you see them even in your community? And do you reach out to them and say, hey, I've been there. I, I, I remember you, you were me 20 years ago. Yes. Yeah. Um, to answer your first question, yes, we are I'm very much involved in our uh, Afghan communities with poetry and reciting poetry. And uh, we have clubs like uh, poetry clubs. I always join them and we do poetry. Um, as far as the young girls and young uh, refugees, yes, mm -hmm. when I meet them, I always tell them like what I learned from my own experience. First thing, what like the people who came my way and pushed education, I do the same thing. It doesn't matter if it's Afghan or if it's Canadian, any young person, if I see mm -hmm. on the coffee shop or anywhere, the first mm -hmm. question I ask, do you go to school? Side working, and uh, that's what I like. I encourage them. I encourage them. Like, it's nothing wrong with working. Working is best, but have a career. Go to school and have a career and move on with your life. That's the path to success. Well, yes. you show you show that you show that. I was really it, again very very impressed upon you that you went everywhere from working on a retail, to working as a dishwasher, to becoming a dental, you know, hygienist, this clean people's teeth. It's like this lady can go everywhere. Oh, but, it, but in the end, you you still found not only that in life, but you also became an incredible mother. So how did motherhood change you a little, as well, having your boys come up and everything and then having to raise a family and obviously doing it in a foreign country? What kind of messages did you share with your children to say, look, I've been through a lot of things but that doesn't mean you have to go through that. You you know, go to school, go get your career, build your life and everything. How do you deal with setbacks with the modern day children today? Uh, I was very open with my children. I explained to them. Mm -hmm. It kind of worked both ways. My children, they helped me and mm -hmm. introduced me to Western society. And I introduced them to the Eastern culture. And um, I emphasized on the... Um, education, like the, the importance of education, how important education is, like especially I myself I so much wanted to have a higher education and I couldn't due to circumstances. I always, I keep telling them, not only them, any young person here, I always tell them, do not take life for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, in this world, like, you know, the sky is the only limit. Mm -hmm. Just move on education and anything you in life you want, it's impossible. It's yeah. possible. It's not impossible. It's mm -hmm. in your own hands. Do mm -hmm. it. Um, it. I talked to my kids, and we were very open. And, and later on, as they graduated from high school and they went to university, they helped me. We kind of kind of shaped one another, and um, we mixed Eastern and Western culture together, and they helped me that... Um, mom, do what makes you happy. Yeah. And then that was the, the turning point question for my life. Yeah. My happiness, nobody ever asked me that what happiness means, mm -hmm. especially as a woman in yes. a male dominated society in less fortunate countries, in war torn countries. Mm -hmm. Like in our culture, like in the individuality, in mm -hmm. Um, your true self it's um, and for it's very unfortunate like these things means it's not respected well yes that's why like when my son asked me mom do what makes you happy it took me back and I I thought about it wow I'm also a person with feelings mm -hmm. And that's why, like, I did the soul search and I went back to my roots and then uh, mm -hmm. uh, examined my journey. And I thought, like, who I am? Who am I as a person, as a woman? That's how it started. And I realized all the things that I did. I just did it for just to survive. Because, yes. But deep inside, I was someone else that I tried mm -hmm. to become. Well, you did. 
You did. And, and one of the things that, you were, that I really liked about the way you wrote in your book was the story and the journey with your children, how they were very westernized. They loved sports. You know, they were loving watching TV. They loved football, loved everything on television. And you sort of kind of came into that as a way of saying, you know, I need to learn a little bit of this. I need to relate to my kids because before I can expect my children to relate to me on my Eastern ways, I have to also come full circle and meet them halfway on their Western ways. And I thought you had a, an incredible balance of that as a parent that you not only brought on Eastern culture to your children, but you didn't necessarily force it upon them. And I really, as a parent, I really appreciated that because you didn't force upon, you know, what you were raised saying, well, I was raised to, you know, live in a war torn country and I had nothing. You're not going to have anything. It was quite the opposite. You wanted them to take advantage of what was available to them in the Western world but having the humility of what you learned growing up in the Eastern world. And I thought your children were incredibly open to say, mom, come try this, you know, come, 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 come look at this, right. Come, come see what this is. And I think the acceptance balance that you had as a parent children relationship, I thought really helped shape, particularly towards the end of the book as well. Even when you had hard times, you still got to fall back to say, I have my children. I have my husband. I have my family I have my life, but you also had your community you know, being part of the Afghan community, and you were obviously a big influence to that. So reading the book, and again, I know English is not your first language. That's why I was really impressed with your your writing. How many edits did you go through? When you sat down and did the first draft to the finished product, how many how many edits did you have to complete? Four, four. Um, to be honest, I had, uh, I worked with an amazing group of people, mm -hmm. and uh, they helped me so much. Marcia Walker, she is a, uh, a New York Times uh, writer, mm -hmm. and uh, she helped me to four times. Like we went back and forth, back and forth with editing. And uh, <laughs> after that, Susan Kiaker, um, she did the copy editing, and mm -hmm. um, Becky Bain, she did the um, graphic. Amazing mm -hmm. people, and Cynthia did the book cover. Amazing mm -hmm. people, that amazing women that I worked with. And uh, they helped me very, yeah. And Cynthia, um, mm -hmm. not Cynthia, Marcia. Marcia, when first time when I wrote it mm -hmm. uh, and sent it to, uh, actually they started with Angela. Angela, if you read the book, like, um, mm -hmm. uh, she passed away and she was amazing woman, amazing woman. Mm -hmm. And she lived in uh, South France. Mm -hmm. She was the first person that I confronted about my book. And I said, like, I'm mm -hmm. going to write my journey. And she encouraged mm -hmm. me. She's like, you know what? Here is my email. Mm -hmm. uh, send me your story and um, I'll help you. Mm -hmm. After that, Marcia. Marcia, like, um, she digged in and she went very deep and deep and then told me, like, gave me story. Gave me story, like, from your childhood. Gave me, like, connected. It was mm -hmm. amazing. It was um, a beautiful journey, a beautiful mm -hmm. journey. Yes, English is not my uh, first language, second language. Mm -hmm. um, I work with amazing people. That helped well, it, it showed the collaboration, but I think your spirit was throughout the book. And I know you definitely got some help, which is great, because writing is a team sport. Writing is not an individual sport. It's about bringing people together. And you did that beautifully for that. Well, one thing that also kind of is, is intriguing to me is that not only when you wrote the book, you have an incredible cover, and I, I totally get the picture, especially saying I'm a big coffee shop person myself. I, I prefer writing in coffee shops than anywhere else. And I could see myself gazing out the window. And I see you gazing out the window in your picture. But when you finished the book and you said, okay, now we're ready to go, how did you market the book? What was the first kind of two or three things you did to get your book out there to get some notoriety? Um. To be honest, like the first thing that it came to my mind, it was uh, marketing. It's a totally different world. Like it was, like, <laughs> okay. different and I wished someone else was taking care of marketing and let me just to do the writing. Right. I had to do it before hiring someone else. I just did a few things. I bought Joanna Penn's book about mm -hmm. marketing. I read it several times, mm -hmm. and I started with. Uh, uh, Indigo, Chapters Indigo, like mm -hmm. the place that I used to go when even when my children were young and I took them to that place and we sat there, we 
bought, uh, bought books and sat there for hours and hours and read books. And that was my dream that mm-hmm. one day I see my book on their shelf. Yes. And as you know, like our generation, my generation, we are like phone calls people. We don't do texts and emails. And, and I'm like, you know what? I'd rather call around instead of texting and emailing. And I right. start calling around Chapters Indigo in Canada, which is both big in Canada. Mm-hmm. And one of the um, Indigo chapters in England and in uh, Youngest Street in Toronto, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Cody McLean, uh, a very young gentleman, a nice person. He answered the phone and he said, like, why don't you send me your book? And then send me a synopsis of your book and an email. And we take it from there. And it started like that. And a couple of weeks later, he mm-hmm. said, I will bring your book on the shelf. Oh, what's wonderful. Amazing. And then she, he said, like, bring thin copies. Mm-hmm. And um, Patrick, the day that I took my book to Chapters Indigo, <laughs> my book and put it in the sh- uh, shelf mm-hmm. where uh, Becoming Michelle Obama's book was there. Oh. And uh, uh, Frank McCord, Angela's mm-hmm. Ashes, mm-hmm. Ernest Hemingway. Oh, my goodness. I just wanted a few minutes alone. Only <laughs> just absorb what really happening. And mm-hmm. Cody said, are you okay? I said, thank you so much. I'm okay. But I just want to be alone in this section for a little while. Um, beautiful. Right now, my book is... And then she, he also scheduled a book signing for me. And right now, my book is at their store at mm-hmm. Clinton and uh, um, Younger Street, downtown Toronto. Mm-hmm. That was the first thing I did. And um, I keep doing emailing, like calling and... Uh, um, yeah, that's so far. This is how I have been like marketing my book. Excellent. Yeah, I haven't done anything else. Yeah. But that's really something, and that's wonderful that Word it got big. I'm sorry. Word of mouth, like I Word of mouth. I go, yes. I just talk about my like I, the coffee shop. I go. I just yes. have a flyer of my book. I gave it to them, and I know um, the people I know. And yes. the, the gym, I go. I talk to them, and I gave a call a flyer of my book, and I talk to them, and then they receive it so well and then they welcome me and they talk to me. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, it's well-deserving. And I'm glad that you, uh, I'm glad that you've experienced the marketing is because every writer I have on this podcast, I always ask the marketing question and everybody says the same thing. I wish I could just write <laughs> that somebody else do the marketing for me. I no, I know. I know. I wish I just need someone to take care of this. <laughs> Well, but it's the good thing is that, you know, when you're talking about marketing, and this is something that everyone always struggles with, but one of the things that I learned from listening to other writers as well, it's not so much the book, it's the brand, it's the person. And and the more that you market yourself, it really kind of connects people back to the book, not the book to you. And and that's where right, I've talked to some really good people that have said the same thing. They really focus on people have to get to know me. And I think you have a brand as a person particularly not only in your community, but now in the writer's community as well. And I think as more and more people get to know you and your journey, then it becomes, oh, well, maybe I need to read your books. I want to know more about you. And I think that's where I think you've done incredibly well is that you really developed an incredible brand for yourself. And now your book obviously is a huge complimentary to that as well. I got to ask, with with the voice and the accent you have, it's beautiful. Are you doing an audio book? Is an audio book coming? Yes, yes, that's the second, um, that's the next project that I'm working on. It's the audiobook. Mm-hmm. I will do the audiobook uh, probably beginning of next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this audiobook is big, it's huge. I downloaded so many books when I go for a walk. And like I listen to, uh, I just walk with them. I walk yeah. all the writers and authors, and I'm not alone. And I thank them. I'm like, you know, thank you for your company. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely audio was coming. Yeah. Yes. That, that's good to know. Now, obviously, by, and again, I'm not going to want to give the book away because I want people to read it. I want people to enjoy it and absorb it. Mm-hmm. But I was following towards the end of the book and where everything was going. 
and I, and I, I was looking for hooks for potentially another book. Are you going to book in a series or potentially is your next work that you may be working on a different subject matter that you're going to be covering? What, what, what's your next project beyond the Audible book that you're working on? Uh, the next project that I work, it would be the, the, this series, the series of memoir mm -hmm. will continue. Okay. I know, like probably people will expect something different, but mm -hmm. um, I love first person narrative. Like I love like true stories. Mm -hmm. I watch true stories, movies. I read true stories. I read biographies. Nonfiction is my area. Mm -hmm. The next project is uh, the pandemic diaries, like mm -hmm. how a pandemic, how I coped with pandemic when it hit, and we mm -hmm. were like, we got separated from the world, mm -hmm. and how I spent my days as a writer and alone. Mm -hmm. It's just like all the, the, the series of the essays and articles mm -hmm. that I wrote, um, mm -hmm. It would be that's the next project yeah but that's and again that, that's an incredible opening to that because you did not mention that in this book you didn't talk about that so i think the fact that you may have purposely left that out to set up the next book i think is is very wise because i was looking for that in the book is the book timeline that when you were writing you know and a lot of people have written a, their books over the last three years and are now releasing it in 2022 they all have a covid element to that like they were alone, isolated. This is what motivated them to write, you know, create their, their works and so on. But you didn't have any of that. You were just living life. You were going from one city to the next, one job, your you know, challenges of life. And I noticed there was no pandemic mention. But now, obviously, listening that you are looking at, you know, project number two, I think that would be an incredible part of your journey story is what happened to your family when everybody had to go home. And everybody had to sit in the same room for a year or, or a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And how did that change or influence you know things in your life as well, particularly with your children? Yeah, no, that's excellent to see that as well. I guess kind of in closing, as we're kind of winding down today's podcast today, how can people buy your book? What's the best way to get hold of you? What's the best way to buy your book? And, and obviously follow you as well online. I have a website. It's www.parastuamadawi.com. Mm -hmm. And my books are on um, Amazon worldwide. They can get it. Um, also in uh, Ingram, Spar uh, Sparks Ingram, and also mm -hmm. on Chapters, Indigo, and mm -hmm. uh, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, uh, mm -hmm. all these places my books are, but mostly on uh, Amazon worldwide. They can Wonderful. get it. Well, I was blessed to get it on Amazon. <laughs> so when I got the chance to finally leave your review on it yesterday. I figured out what was wrong yeah, with my Thank you so much for, for your help, for your support. It means a lot, especially for an author like me, a new author. Yeah, that means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, no, no. It's my pleasure as well. And, and, and Periso, first of all, thank you for making the time for coming on this week's podcast. I loved your book. Loved, your, loved the cover. Absolutely thought it was, a, I had to ask the question how the cover came about because I was sort of intrigued by the, the look to the left. Now I understand it. It's wonderful. I wish you well on your coffee shop adventures. I'm also a coffee shop adventurist as well. Look forward to your audiobook coming out. Let me know when it does come out. I'd love to have you back on the podcast uh, when it does hit the street as well. I'll definitely save a credit on Audible to get it as well. Thank you so much. Oh, no, you're welcome. And everyone, thank you again for being on this week's Writers on Writers Over Triple Special Podcast. This is your host, Patrick Greenwood. Thanks again, and have a wonderful, safe week. Thank you so much, Patrick.